This video was made to respond to questions by someone who had written us and asked if we would respond to them. We know him only by the name Justin, and so that's the name we'll sh we will use in this discussion. I, Steph, will read the questions, and they will be responded to by someone in the circle of love. Thank you. Justin says, I am very familiar with the Anunnaki and Elohim, but in my mind, when I see the Elohim, they look different than what other people describe. I see a stout being with elongated, elongated skulls and huge, beautiful black eyes. Some are taller, like seven foot, and others a bit smaller, and the shorter ones are wearing robes of sort that are standing on a planet with their large brain elongated skulls doing things most humans could not even comprehend. Am I correct it? Am I correct in my assessment or mistaken? Their skulls are elongated like the Paracas skulls found throughout Peru, but even longer. Who would like to take that question? <clears throat> Tobias will address that question. First of all, the Elohim resembled in many respects the Anunnaki. They were the first members of the human race that were created on earth <coughs> through a mixture of the DNA of what we then called the gorillas, but what are actually a member of the great ape com community. In that day, we referred to all of them as gorillas. The Elohim were tall and thunder. They were not stout. They had long fingers, and they had a skull that was slightly more elongated, but nothing near the Paracas skulls. The tendency to both create elongated skulls through a form of artificial binding in many cultures reflected the idea that the more pointed your skull was, the more important you were. And this eventually resulted in a group that actually <coughs> were able to alter their biology in order to have these naturally forming elongated skulls because the biology can also be informed by the desires of the individuals themselves. So it is an interactive system that a particular need, for example, may result over a period of time in a adaptation of that particular segment of the physical biology or it might be better stated that particular family in the totality of the human race. Adaptation is a particular aspect of the physical realm that has been studied for many centuries. The Elohim had pale skin. They were not dark. They did have what you would consider large eyes, and they were not dark colored. They were actually a range of colors from blue to <clears throat> a 
a greenish hue. The Anunnaki were more robust in their form and they were made to live in a confined space so they had shorter arms and legs whereas the Elohim were created from the ape population that then had quite long arms and they continue to have long arms and the added graceful movement that came with long legs. So they were tall, thin, and pale in appearance with narrow, flexible fingers that could manipulate delicate instruments, which was also true of the Anunnaki. Although their limbs were shorter, their fingers were also very flexible. And there was a sort of crest, you could call it, that ran from the front of the skull of the Anunnaki to the back. This crest was not present in the Elohim. The crest was a remnant of the ancient civilization on Nibiru where there was a tendency to be in a climate that created a need for a flap at the top of the head that would flop from one side to another. However, the Anunnaki no longer had need of this flap in their spaceship, and so it became reduced to a simple crest that was more like a bulge and didn't do anything to protect them from the sun in their eyes and so they were very sensitive to the sunlight on earth and to the other aspects of a volatile climate. However, the Elohim soon adjusted to it because of their ape inheritance, as did the other humans who really were comfortable in their environment from which they were taken, although they were often transported to different parts of the earth, which made it difficult for them to adapt. So that was an additional problem they had. The Elohim mostly worked in climate controlled spaces, which allowed the Anunnaki to visit without any stress, and therefore they were not subject to as much climatic variation as the other humans. So I hope this answers your question. After the mixing of the DNA, of course, the other humans
began to develop a more advanced physiology as we think of it, which allowed for more brain development and more dexterity, increased ability to handle various activities that the ape physiology would have made more difficult. So the other humans were less adapted to scientific and technical work than the Elohim. However, through the mixing of the DNA, their capacity for these types of activities increased as they also became more trusting on their own forms of adaptation. So not just the DNA was being spread, but there is the natural adaptation that occurs through the generations, which resulted in the Paracas skulls, for example, which is an anomaly in that particular family or bloodline. Because in each succeeding generation, they trusted on re-elevating their status so much that they actually began to give birth to children with these elongated skulls. It was a bloodline that eventually <coughs> died out or dropped its gene expression for the elongated skull. However, there may be occasional children that have more elongated skulls than others. Now, the question for Michael Jackson will not be answered because he chooses not to enter into the debate or concerns about his death. He's dead and he's alive. That's all people need to know because how we leave that life is not so important as what we leave behind and what we take with us. Keep that in mind. The question here, this is Steph talking. The question was for Michael Jackson, hello Michael, may we ask and speak about your physical death from your body and what really happened in the hospital with your doctor concerning the drug propofol? The next question is for Jesus Christ. Well, we'll say for Jesus because in our group he understands that Christ consciousness is there for all, for Jesus. Dear Jesus, you were known by many people now for saying these passages from the Gospel of John. And he gives two examples. One, book of John, verse 56, Jesus said, Whoever has come to understand the world has found only a corpse, and whoever has found a corpse is superior to the world. And it's translated in the next example, book of John, verse 80, Jesus said, Whoever has come to know the world has found the body. Whoever has found the body, the world is not worthy of them. So Justin asks, So Jesus, are these your words that you spoke when on and in the earth plane of existence? And if so, can you clarify what you meant, Jesus, by this, as people believe that the world is one big corpse of dead bodies that have solidified into stone and giant mountains are fallen giants that have become the mountains themselves and to cut down the great tall trees that stretch for miles high into the sky. I don't know who believes these things, but I trust that he has found that somewhere. So Jesus, are you available and do you have an answer to this? Yes, I am here. Thank you, Steph, for interpreting for me what I have to say to people because 
even though I try to be as concise as I can, many people misunderstand <coughs> what I say. And so you try to make them understand that I was just a man who came to earth to unearth his own trust on being a child of the light and to help others understand that they too were children of the light. So that's the essential message that I had have to give to humanity. Now as to the question he asked, what I said and which of course became garbled not just through translation but by the fact that what I said was committed only to the memories of those who repeated it which a lot of people did in those days because a lot of people did not have access to the written word so they would pass down through stories and through their discussions things they had heard things they had seen and these would be repeated again and again and again and sometimes it would get very very garbled and sometimes it sort of approached the original so we shall start with that thought so what I tried to tell people is that if you can understand the nature of physical reality you will see that it is always a trust on God energy it is always a trust that God exists and that God exists in all things it is always a trust on love you see because God is a God of love and not a God of hate and if God is a God of love and God energy is in everything because God is the creator of everything then everything is love and if you understand this you will not be taken in by the people who try to sell you a bunch of goods and then make you follow them you will just say no thank you I don't need to be told how to think today because my heart is open and my eyes as well and I can see that everything on earth is a reflection of love from above and that we don't have anything to fear and that's the good news you see that you have nothing to fear because death is impossible and everybody that I knew on earth was trusting on death they were trusting on the idea that they were mortal bodies in a mortal world that had unfurled because God had created it to be like that and they had to accept the fact that God had created them to suffer because they did suffer and what they did not understand is that God did not create them to suffer they created God in a limited version that mimicked their own trust on suffering and their own trust on hatred because they chose not to trust on love and that's a choice you see that's an essential choice you can trust on love from above and love from within and love at everything you see or you can trust on hatred because hatred is just like saying that you don't trust on love so if you don't trust on love that would be like saying that you don't trust on God you trust that there is something that opposes God and we've been through this before in other discussions that the only thing that opposes God is nothing and nothing is potential and so it goes round and round however for those who trust on the idea of physicality 
as informing the soul, they will be very, very, very confused. And they will listen to me say something like that, or even the way it has been presented and interpreted, and come up with such bizarre explanations is that the world is a big corpse of bodies. What in the heck? <laughs> it's exactly the opposite of what I tried to say. And yet, they would turn everything I say upside down and try to understand it with their head on the ground and their feet in the sky. Because that's the way that I see it. They wear their hat on their feet and they put their head in the dirt. And that's how they get so confused that they cannot understand that God energy is here to be reused and reused and reused because it is the trust on the creative capacity of the children of the light. Now I hope that answers your question. I will turn the mic over to whoever wants to answer your next question. The last question, this is Stephanie, the last question he says is, I have included a picture from my backyard which appears to be beings in a craft with elongated skulls and large black eyes. Who are these beings that just very recently gave me a visit and what did they want? And of course I would say I have no clue. I have no clue what these pictures could signify or what's caused them uh, to what causes this to appear. It appears that the pictures of the yard are taken with some kind of a, I don't know how photography works, but with some kind of an unusual darkness penetrating is it infrared or whatever photography so and there appears to be what looks to me like a um, I don't know how to explain this an upside down vase with but it's there's two black hollows at the top in other words it's a little confusing for me does anybody have any thoughts on this? Tobias says, I have no clue either, Steph. I have looked at the images and I don't know what they depict. So I can't speak to it. And since it is something that involves Justin and his own experiences, it's not something that I can interpret for him. He has to interpret his experience himself. And if it makes sense to him, then it makes sense to him. If it doesn't make sense to him, it doesn't make sense to him. The ability to see things that perhaps are not seen by others is the trust on the ability to experience a reality that is unique and perhaps very much needed in order to begin to pierce the veil between the seen and the unseen. The unseen, of course, can vary from such things as microbes that are only seen under a microscope or distant planets or objects in space that are not visible to the eye or even sometimes with powerful telescopes they can't be seen. So there can be aids that will help us see what was previously unseen and that can be fascinating. The unseen, in its strictest sense, is the world of reality, of core reality. It is 
the reality of the children of the light because the children of the light take their identity from the initial splitting of the light you might say in order to create the physical reality and so the patterns of God energy as it experiences itself in the interaction with itself are the continual underlying patterns of physical reality and they can not be limited you see by humanity they cannot be limited by humanity humanity must interpret his reality in order to have a reality at all you have to be able to interpret it you have to have stories we should say that make sense to you because otherwise you could not talk to each other you could not have this experience of being separate and yet together because you couldn't say hey I sat on a chair today if others did not understand that particular pattern of interaction if they did not understand the idea of a chair and the idea of sitting on it in fact if they did not understand the idea of a human form so this is a continual aspect of the interaction of the patterns of reality and their manifestations in the physical realm and they meet at a certain point where they exchange their trust on life as you know it so that the human body for example is based on a pattern and so there is a moment you might say at conception where the pattern becomes manifested through a unique Trust on the historical patterns of interaction among the children of the light. For they trust upon their own uniqueness, that they are unique versions of God energy. And so there is always going to be this aspect of your experience where you will see something that others might not see and then you have to interpret it however if others do not also have the experience they have no ability to interpret it as you do and so without having had that experience in my story I have no way of interpreting what you are seeing and it might be that a person who has a lot of experience with photography and different forms of night vision equipment might be able to help you to get a different point of view on what this might be I hope this answer makes sense to you because I think that you are a sincere explorer of reality and reality can encompass what we see and what we do not see and there can be a lot of vibration two people can look at the same scene in a movie and draw different 
conclusions from it. There has been many, many demonstrations of how people can miss something in plain sight if they are focused on a particular sequence of events, such as the man in a gorilla costume who walks through a bunch of people who are dancing or playing basketball, and the one who is watching the video is trying to focus on a particular feat, such as who passes the basketball the most, or who is the best dancer. And they might miss the man in the gorilla suit who walks right through the crowd because their attention is diverted. And that's the way it is on life. Most people are focused upon a particular set of criteria for their life experience and they miss all the rest of the stuff that's going on. And when they begin to understand this, when they begin to think about it more, they may begin to open up to a greater reality. And eventually, as Jesus says, they may be less influenced by the physical forms of their dreams, which is really what it is, and become more aware of the nature of God energy and how it shapes itself over and over again in unique patterns that will appear to come and go but are never quite the same. Thank you for asking this wonderful question. I am Tobias and I have been here before to answer questions. I am a good friend of Steph's. We have had many lives together and the rest of the crew that make up the core group in the circle of love are all very, very much united in their effort to help humanity understand that we're all in this together. We're not dead, you see. We're alive. However, we refer to people who are unable to understand the nature of the children of the light while they are in the earth vibration as dead men walking because they trust on death, you see, and on being deaf and blind to that man in the gorilla suit walking among them. And the story of Jesus is that he came to see the man in the gorilla suit, you see. He came to see the fakery that was influencing humanity. And that's what he tried to tell them. That's what he tried to show them. And we're all in this together, people. We're all in this together. He and you are no different other than whether or not you are ready to surrender to the beauty of the constant shifting of the light that follows the children of the light when they are in flight because it is their joy to play with you. Thank you.